questions. I'll do my very best to um, to watch the chat as well. Hopefully, Catherine will also be keeping an eye an eye out for any questions that people may have. Um, and so, um, yeah, over to uh, Alessio and Kate talking about exploring the mental health and psychosocial experience of asylum seekers, refugees, and undocumented migrants in the post-migration context. Thank you. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you, Nicola, for the introduction. So, yeah, my name is Alessio Albanese. Today I'm going to present some of the work that I conducted as part of my PhD. I'm going to share my slides uh, with you and share my screen. Um, Yeah, can you all see? Okay. Yeah. So, yes, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for coming along to the presentation. I'm going to present on exploring the mental health and psychosocial experiences of asylum seekers, refugees, and undocumented migrants in the post migration context. So, a bit of, uh, a bit of background in terms of, I'm sorry, in terms of um, the context of this research. So, my interest in this area began whilst volunteering at Calais refugee camp in France in 2017. And then in 2018, was able to design and develop the direction of my research um, related, in fact, to, to the mental health of these uh, marginalized groups. It was apparent from the outset that post-migration difficulties exacerbated by the asylum process fostered mental health and health inequalities in, in these populations both in the UK and also internationally. So a bit of an overview of today's talk, a bit on the background, I'll present on the three different methods that I've used, and uh, which are systematic review methodography, reflexive thematic analysis, and then the approach of theory of candidacy applied to the data, a bit of the results and the implications uh, of, of the work conducted. So, so briefly on the background, um, um, you know, one second. Okay, sorry, I had a, a video open of, of all of you and I couldn't see my slide. So uh, globally, over 70 million people are displaced. Approximately 5 million of these are asylum seekers and around 30 million are refugees. Uh, negative post-migration experiences that happen pre, post and uh, during migration, increase the vulnerability of these groups in experiencing mental health difficulties and lower levels of well-being. Particularly in the country of resett resettlement, so in the post-migration context, these migrant groups experience several social determinants of mental health, including housing issues, unemployment, a hostile asylum seeker um, system, um, um, and, and sort of like the hostile environment policies, uh, poverty, family separation, language difficulties and poor access to healthcare. So, so as I was mentioning, um, hostile asylum policies in the UK and internationally, internationally have a direct impact, negative impact on the um, migration, post-migration difficulties of these groups. So initially I conducted a systematic review and a methodography uh, with the aim to explore and synthesize the qualitative literature on the impact on post-migration life difficulties on mental health among asylum seekers and refugees who live in high income countries and how these influence access to healthcare. Attached to the systematic review, I also conducted a meta-ethnography. I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. So initially these are the kind of systematic review results. Um, so on the left, we can see the different stages of the systematic review. And at the very bottom, we see the number of included studies on the right hand side of the page, we see uh, records ex excluded at each level and reasons for exclusion. So 20 studies were included, 11 were qualitative and nine were mixed method. But of the mixed method studies, only the qualitative component was included in the work in the meta ethnography. The studies were from seven countries, some were um, in dual country settings. So for example, Canada and the United States or the UK and publication dates spanned from 2006 to 2022. 
So the reason of applying a meta-ethnography to the papers was in order to develop a theoretical understanding of the data and to synthesize the literature uh, by conducting an in-depth analysis on, uh, on this small number of papers. The analytical process was guided by Atkins and Franz et al and included three steps, which are determining how studies are related, so first order constructs, translating studies into one another, second order constructs, and developing a novel line of argument synthesis, which is also known as third order construct. So basically in first and second order construct, some of the main sort of themes that, that were identified were related to language and interpretation issues, gender differences, for example, women were less likely to access healthcare for mental health, men, migration status, and, and uh, family and community and religion. The second order constructs included, in fact, community and religion and family as a double-edged sword, which was both a facilitator in accessing healthcare and help seeking, but also was hindering it due to complex socio-cultural reasons. Uh, this impacted on access to healthcare and, and it was quite evident in the studies selected. So language abilities and provision of professional interpreters were also um, important aspects of access to care. Um, and the biomedical model was often um, seen as a way of defining problems which was actually unable to truly meet the complexity of the psychosocial needs and the mental health needs of asylum seekers and refugees, because it was quite reductionistic and only looked at mental health instead of looking at the psychosocial aspects of, of, of mental health. Uh, clinicians often were seen to intervene by focusing on these at the expense of dealing with complex social determinants. Oftentimes, the, the intervention provided was by the use of psychotropic medication, but this showed sometimes limited uptake or continuity of care. Um, in the clinical encounter, also because of practical reasons, you know, for example, a psychologist or a GP cannot fully um, deal with issues around housing or the asylum process, and therefore tends to intervene on what they can deal with at the time of consultation, which is generally mental health problems. So on the back of this work, I then started to work on uh, reflexive thematic analysis, even though the initial outline of the second study would have been participatory action research using photo voice. But because of COVID-19, these plans were disrupted. And therefore, uh, I decided together with my supervision team to focus on interviews instead. So um, 18 participants agreed to be interviewed. These were asylum seekers, refugees, and undocumented migrants. In order to analyze the interviews, I chose RTA, Reflexive Thematic Analysis, because of its interpretative and constructivist approach, and because it allows for the in-depth exploration of participants' subjective experiences. So RTA is based on six steps. So becoming familiar, familiar with the data, developing a coding framework, um, identifying themes and refining them, identifying relationship between different teams and, and also how teams relate to one another and whether there are any sub-teams as well, um, naming those teams and then presenting the analysis. So here are some of the results from the RTA. So the main themes were three, the asylum process, mental health experiences, and access to healthcare, and a number of sub-teams were also identified in relation to each of these themes. So the asylum process. The asylum process was frequently discussed by participants, regardless of their current status. So some of the participants that I interviewed, for example, um, were, were um, initially asylum seekers as they arrived in the UK. But then as time passes, some of them received leave to remain or, or refugee status, whereas others had been refused their application and became undocumented migrants. So within this main team, three sub-teams were identified, experiences on arrival, living in limbo, inability to work and financial constraints. Now I'm gonna just show a few 
uh, a few quotes that, that will illustrate uh, some of these themes and subthemes. So experiences on arrival. Um, there is a considerable body of research which shows the negative impact of detention on arrival. And several of the participants that took part in the interviews had experienced detention upon arrival to the UK. For example, participant number seven reported on the re-traumatizing effect and the impact on mental health of, of, of detention. And, and the participant said, so this put me back to the experiences in the country of origin when I was in jail and I've tried everything to forget about this experience. And so at the airport, everything came up because when I was arrested in the country of origin, the body search reached a certain point that I even was completely naked and I felt humiliated. So at the airport, I felt as though I had the same. So all the memories came back. Another aspect was living in limbo. For many, um, applying for asylum was something that lasted years. And research also shows that this state of limbo has a negative impact on the mental health of individuals seeking asylum. And one of the participants described this um, protracted state of uncertainty by saying, I am an asylum seeker and living with my wife and two children. I am an asylum seeker for nine years, more than nine years. I know many families who are still on the asylum for eight years, more than eight years, some from seven and so on. It is a lengthy process, quite lengthy. So, so this process can, can stay on for many years for people and of course can have negative impact. And during this time, people are often unable to work and live under very restrictive financial constraints. For example, if one is an asylum seeker receives about 40 pounds per week in support, and this is often not even enough for food. The difficulties of being an asylum seeker, asylum seeker um, of course, are, are shown in relation to financial constraints within the literature and employment is one of the main issues. And interestingly, even for people who um, are given refugee status, employment and are legally um, entitled to work, uh, sometimes employment um, is difficult because of issues around discrimination. For example, one of the participants said that looking for a job, getting a job, just something to do, it's enough to, another difficult one. Even if you've got the right to work, applying for a job and getting it is a challenge because first of all, your accent, the way you come across, so you can be judged even before you go for an interview. So this is also challenging for undocumented migrants, sometimes even more challenging for undocumented migrants because due to their status, they don't receive any financial support from the government. Um, the thing is, when the asylum claim is rejected, basically financially you're affected, especially having a child, just make it even more, uh, a lot worse. Therefore, for example, the financial support they offer you is not even enough for food, as I mentioned earlier. So mental health experiences, that was another team, and three sub-teams were identified within that. Idioms of distress, psycho psychosomatic issues, and sleep problems. So idioms of distress are very, very well reported in the literature. These include things like depression, anxiety. It's, it's a type of emotional acculturation, so-called. And within Western cultures, we often use it, even though it's not supported by a diagnosis. You know, we use words like anxiety and depression um, daily. Uh, and the participants actually used this type of language when they were describing their mental health experiences in relation to the asylum process in particular. So one of the participants said, it's very depressing. It's very much depressing. Still, I am under depression because of the Home Office rejecting my appeal at this moment. Another aspect was, was psychosomatic issues. And oftentimes, par participants described the fact that physical and mental health issues were interrelated and that sometimes mental health issues can trigger physical health problems and vice versa. And one participant made this point by saying, but if your mind is not settled, you cannot do anything. So it affects your body, your health, your physical health. So the mental and the physical actually complements each other. If one is having a problem, the other also definitely have a problem. 
it becomes a problem and then it develops other diseases within you. This again was in relation to the asylum, to the asylum process and living under stress for protracted periods. Sleep problems was another issue that was discussed. Now there are some studies that show the prevalence of sleeping problems in asylum seekers and refugees um, that go from moderate to severe. Um, and there are a number of sort of post-migration stresses as well as pre-migration difficulties or, or traumatic experiences that can explain these findings. These resonates with a lot of the, the, the points the participants made in the interviews. And one of them, an undocumented migrant said, the stress I have is, for example, normally I don't have enough sleep. I don't go to sleep until two o'clock in the morning. And that's related to the stress I'm experiencing. I'm experiencing, you know, sleep doesn't come until that point really. So really we can see again how the, the issues related to the asylum system and issues related to being undocumented migrant, for example, um, encompass all aspects of life from financial difficulties to sleep, to mental health, to psychosomatic issues and so on. Another aspect of the interviews was um, access to healthcare that came in quite strongly. Um, and three, again, three um, uh, sub-themes were identified here. One was issues registering with the GP, communication difficulties and in interpretation, and psycho, uh, psychotropic medication and psychological therapy. Now, issues around communication difficulties and in interpretation, we can see already has come up twice. It will come up a few more times during the the, the, this presentation, because uh, communication difficulties and interpretation seems to be affecting people at several levels, from, for example, policies that use a language to be written in to the clinical encounter one to one. So language pops up at different at different levels for people. So registering with the GP, the interviewees, of course, describe the difficulties with this, also because there is. There is poor information related to how one can register with the GP. Sometimes people don't know how to go about it. And there is an application registration card, ARC, that people need to get for them to access primary and secondary care. In Scotland, differently to England, in Scotland, people can access primary and secondary care free of charge, regardless of their migration status. So, but they would still need the application registration card to do so. So one of the participants said, actually, when I arrived in Glasgow, I didn't know about how to register in the medical because migrant help gave me only one letter. They said, you can go there because at the time I had an ARC, um, this is the card they give you at the home office. So migrant help told me, you can use this letter to go to a GP. I'm very much difficulty how to register um, my family to the nearest GP because at the start, my wife had some problems, a shoulder problem. Nobody can see without registration. So this card is very important. So basically here we can see that um, a person arrived here and their wife already had uh, an issue with their health and they couldn't access the healthcare system right away. They had to register first. Communication difficulties and interpretation. So, Language difficulties were a problem across the spectrum. And um, even for people who actually were refugees or were international refugees that took part in the interviews, so people that applied for their, for their uh, asylum before arriving in the UK. Um, for example, this one participant, female refugee, said, frankly speaking, financially and health-wise, I have the support that I need, thank God because basically people who have refugee status have access to housing, have access to welfare support. So everything was fine. The only first barrier that I have is the language barrier, the English language and the difficulty I have because I'm 70, I'm in, I'm in the 70s and I'm getting too old to start learning a language. That was the main barrier for me, basically. So psychotropic medication, because of limited availability of psycho, uh, psychological services and long waiting times, um, oftentimes this is seen as coinciding with psychotropic medication being prescribed more in recent years. 
Uh, this is, we go back to the point I was making earlier on about the fact that at the clinical encounter, sometimes GPs do what they can in that 10 minute um, uh, appointment that they have. And I think because referring to secondary care is so difficult for people to access, then oftentimes they revert to psychotropic medication. And one of the participants mentioned receiving these from their GP. I told the GP about the health issues that I have been experiences, experiencing. And the only thing that they said was, yes, you're experiencing some stress and they gave me some medication. However, there are some risks related to taking medication. There are side effects that are well, well established in, in the literature. Um, and for example, one of the participants mentioned that by saying, I took this medicine, floxetine, which has side effects. It's not good for me. After two weeks, I cry, I can't sleep. I have problems and I go to George Square and I fall asleep there or, or in the lobby in a chair. So a bit of the conclusion about this first part here. So the experiences that the interviews shared, particularly in relation to their mental health and well-being, clearly seem to result from home office policies and, and political decisions. The, 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 the hostile environment policies created by the home office often vulnerabilize individuals, so make them vulnerable. They're not vulnerable themselves, but they become vulnerable when exposed to these structural difficulties, structural barriers, and create the conditions for the exacerbation of distress and low well-being. So then based on this RTA, the interviews were reanalyzed using the theoretical concept of candidacy because I became more and more interested in the access to care aspect related to mental health. So here is a um, bit of a mapping of, of uh, the, seven stage, um, the seven phases of candidacy from identification, which is either somebody identifying themselves as a candidate or a service identifying them as a candidate, for example, for screening. Uh, the navigation, how to navigate the system, permeability, so how easy it is to actually find a point of contact with a the service, then appearing in a at a service and asserting candidacy, say making an appointment with the GP, for example, adjudications by professional interpreters, we've seen somewhere in the form, for example, of psychotropic medication, offers and resistance, whether people take up those offers or whether they actually say, no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to take that offer of care and um, operating conditions. So I have a quote for each just to illustrate my points. So identification um, in terms of in terms of receiving support, people describe that um, several participants use the, the, the biomedical language of mental health. Um, and but some participants also talked about mental health in the context of broader psychosocial experiences. So basically they say, basically it's depression from you not having people that you used to know around you, you've been alone now, and some sort of anxiety thinking, do you have any life? What does the future hold for you? Like, um, like I'm better, all these kind of fears, coping with anxiety, stress, stuff like that makes you feel like it compounds. Uh, it compounds when you're in, it makes it even worse because you just keep thinking about that stuff. So the thing is actually like, add to my mental health and mental illness. So this is a bit of a way where the participant was describing the many difficulties that they're finding related to family reunification, for example, the first part, but also issues about what is my future like? Will I get refugee status or will I be deported? And if I get deported, what are the consequences of that? Then navigation, people uh, try to navigate the system in terms of, for example, um, finding a point of contact with the GP. Um, um, one of the participants said, so I didn't know the process for the GP. I don't know where to go if I was sick, uh, but it's really a big problem. Imagine if I had a really hard case or if I can't walk or anything, I have no phone, no nothing to contact if I got sick really bad, just I'd be at the house. So I don't know. So people wouldn't know how to navigate the system. Permeability. Uh, people talked about primary care as being the more porous or more permeable service. 
in the, within the healthcare system. Um, uh, but some participants still found it difficult, particularly related in relation to COVID-19. One participant said for appointment with hospitals, everything is done by phone, the appointments are slow, everything is slow. It is not possible to see the GP because of COVID now. And even when you get in touch with an organization such as the Scottish Refugee Service, it's done by phone and it's very slow. It concerns all asylum seekers. So basically the system became less permeable. Uh, um, um, as COVID-19 happened. Then appearing at the service, a uh, participant talked about the, the difficulties that they had in appearing at the service and asserting their candidacy. Um, and one of the participants talked about language difficulties. So another factor is uh, that of a language barrier. Even though I have to learn how to speak English, it becomes a big barrier to me for me to communicate. Then adjudication, some of the interviewees talked about the adjudication of professional mental health support, which occur, occurred in the form of referral from a primary care clinician to a secondary care one. And here, for example, one was referred to a psychologist and managed to attend some of the sessions. So the first point was, I was referred to a psychologist. So I just went and attended these sessions. Offers and resistance. People talked about some of the offers that were made, generally in terms of psychotropic medication. So one participant said, I went and saw the doctor, the GP, and the GP described depression tablets. I saw the GP and I told him about my concerns because I have sleeping issues, and he gave me prescription regarding these issues. But then some participants also talked about low continuity of care, for example, or discontinuing care. So I'm using medication only when I, see, when I feel under depression, very much under depression. So I'm not using this medicine regularly. So people kind of tend to not want to use it regularly, even though there are also risks associated with that. So during the analysis of the interviews, there were three levels of operating conditions. There was a macro, meso, and a micro level of conditions. So at the macro level, we see the home office is punitive restrictions on individuals and the negative impact it has on the abilities to access on their ability to access a variety of services, including healthcare. We kind of discussed that a bit. But here, for example, one of the participants talked about not getting money, uh, not receiving enough. I can't travel to wherever I want to travel, for example, because there are restrictions related to people seeking asylum and to stay within a certain area. Um, and also being undocumented migrants, sometimes people are fearful of maybe deportation. So they start to try to stay with friends. Uh, they feel isolated and, um, and yeah, and they experience destitution basically. At the meso level, the analysis identified uh, issues around interpersonal relationships and the influence of the community and third sector organization. One participant talked about, I get support from government community project because they're also supporting me materially and emotionally. And I was volunteering with them previously. There is a community that I have because you're meeting up people and learning new things, new situations, and people are helping um, you to learn new stuff as well as contribute. When you're engaging with people, your mind as an outlet, you can talk to people and forget other stuff. And then, and then again, uh, the micro level, we see issues around language um, as one of the main barriers to candidacy, particularly. Um, um, one person said, you know, my English is not my mother tongue. My mother tongue is Urdu. So I find it difficult to express myself and I only draft official emails or, or things like that in, in English, but generally I, sp I would speak Urdu. Uh, so this is the first challenge for me in the beginning. Um, so a couple of points on the asylum process as a social determinants of health. So three methods were, were used here, systematic review method ethnography, reflexive thematic analysis, and candidacy. The results in, uh, illustrate the important social determinants of health in exploring the mental health and psychosocial experiences of these populations. And these results resonate with the wider international literature on the negative impact on the asylum system across different country settings, um, also on, phys on physical health and mental health. 
So a couple of points on the implications. As I said earlier, asylum seekers and refugees and undocumented migrants are not preserved vulnerable, but they're made vulnerable and, and by, by structurally uh, structural barriers and they're marginalized and vulnerabilized in the context of a hostile um, asylum system um, and um, hostile policies. Another issue is that undocumented migrants seldom uh, feature in health research and are often erroneously uh, discussed as asylum seekers. Uh, so it is essential that researchers and clinicians facilitate these groups in participation uh, in research and also in the design and development of future mental health services. Whilst diagnosis of mental health can be helpful, sometimes we need, you know, sometimes they can obfuscate deep, deeper issues related to, to psychosocial issues, or structural issues. And so we need to be mindful of the social cultural understanding of mental health and illness, particularly the way in which these populations view health and illness in their culture. And we need to integrate multidisciplinary, multi-agency approaches to meet the complex unmet needs of these groups. So thank you for listening. This is all for me. Uh, for now, I'm going to pass it on to Kate, who is going to do another part of the presentation, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Okay. So, um, just to, to sort of follow on from what um, Alessio has been talking so um, eloquently uh, about and with such enthusiasm uh, from his, his PhD, and I was lucky to be one of um, Alessio's supervisors, and it's been a really enjoyable experience, um, even though we did have to unexpectedly navigate our way through a, a global pandemic. But what the work that Alessio and in particular to my other PhD students um, has really started to um, focus their thinking around is this notion of migration as a, a social determinant of health. Um, and so I just want to, to really show where we're at in terms of our thinking and how we might take this forward um, at the moment. So many of you will be familiar with the WHO definition of social determinants of health as non-medical factors which influence health outcomes. And these are the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live in age, and also the wider set of forces and systems which shape the conditions for daily life. Uh, and often I think that wider set of forces, um, people sometimes refer to as structural determinants of health, but the the language is, uh, around these is a bit slippery uh, in terms of, of what we're, we're necessarily thinking about. Um, what we're probably all familiar with is the uh, sort of Dahlgren and Whitehead model of the social determinants of health, which thinks uh, beyond the um, sort of genetic or the, the, the sort of non-modifiable or less modifiable issues um, of, of a person's in being in terms of their age, um, issues around sex, but obviously also thinking about gender, um, and also in terms of some of the, the, the genetic um, makeup of a person and how that might influence um, how their, their sort of body might respond, for example, to infection. Ed, sorry to, sorry to disturb you, but we can't actually see the slides moving on. I wasn't sure if you were aware. No. Um, so oh. we're, we're, we're still on your, your first slide. Sorry, I didn't want to break your flow there, but just... Really sorry aware. about that. Oh, that's all right. Don't worry. Let's see. Um... Right. Is it moving on now? Wait, I, I can't see your screen at all, Kate, I'm afraid. Hmm. Oh, hang on. That's a bit of a Right, I'll shut it down and I'll 
start again. Um, right, give me a moment. Okay, very strange. And oh, it's not sharp. He seems to have vanished. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. I got many slides, but uh, they're just not showing up at the moment in terms of screen sharing. They were there earlier. Right, hang on. Alice has just spotted it for me. So, can you see those? Yep, we've got it on the, we can see, it's not in slideshow, so we can see your side slides um, down the left-hand side of the screen. We can see your, your first opening slide. Uh, okay, so let me just check. Is it moving on now? No. No, okay. Alessio has a solution for me. I think so. Meeting you. Yeah, I noticed you just that. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Maybe. Yeah, we can see Maybe. it as that's right. Slide. Great. I would. Sorry about that. That's so, okay. Brief recap. WHO definition um, is in terms of social determinants of health as these non-medical factors. And then the model, which many of us are familiar with, is this Dalgren and Whitehead rainbow model, um, starting to think, first of all, about the individual, um, and then from that about um, issues of, of lifestyle, um, which is also in itself a bit of a loaded term, but, you know, things that might determine a person's ability in terms of um, physical activity or thinking about diet or alcohol consumption. And then moving out across these wider influences and in people's health and ability to live healthily in terms of living and working conditions and more general socioeconomic, cultural, and environmental conditions. However, this has been critiqued um, in particular by uh, David Ingleby, um, who wrote about this um, back in 2012 where he um, criticised researchers um, or sort of made this critical observation that as researchers, when we're thinking about social determinants of health, much of the um, attention has really been around socioeconomic determinants, um, issues of um, people's socioeconomic status. And that in the field of uh, migration in particular, there had been little consideration of, for example, issues of ethnicity or race, um, or indeed about migration or migrant status. And I think over the last 10 years or so, there probably has been much more of a consideration around ethnicity, but also about the impacts of discrimination on the basis of race and ethnicity and the way in which that can play into how people um, are actually able to consider their health or be able to live healthily. But I still think that what we are seeing is around the um, literature and thinking about social determinants of health is less of a consideration around the impact of migration or migrant status. And this has really been work, um, several of you have no doubt have heard, um, Anna Isaacs and Anna Black who are uh, supervised by myself and also uh, Nikki Burns and Sarah McDonald uh, here uh, in the, the School of Health and Wellbeing. And the work that they have done over the last sort of six to 10 years around the impact of migration and in particular the impact of the asylum system on people's health and wellbeing. Anna Isaacs particularly uh, used the lens of both candidacy, which you've heard about, and also structural vulnerability, which is the way in which um, systems are organised to really um, position people um, in, in sort of within society 
on the basis of things like socioeconomic status, racial and cultural status, but also the way in which systems such as migration or, or labour force uh, constrain people's ability to actually access health care and pursue healthy lifestyles. And Anna was able to expand this idea of the operating conditions that Alessio has already referred to, thinking about, for example, the impact of discrimination or of legal status on people's positions and ability to think about their health. And I think, again, Alessio has demonstrated that really well today in terms of the way that which the asylum process is really focusing on constraining people's ability to think about their health and well-being, and in particular, mental health. Um, Anna found um, similar um, areas in relation to some more general health and well-being about the asylum process being this overarching determinant of health by putting people in perpetual uncertainty, by removing control over their life, um, they are continually viewed as suspect and stripped of their humanity. And I think what we're seeing um, with Alessio's work is how that particularly starts to impact on people's mental health and well-being. Anna Black also looked at some of the issues uh, in the wider um, uh, sort of social environment in which people live. And in particular, um, looked at the ways in which media representation of migration and migrants impacts on people's health. In her work, which she's presented at Gramnet seminars before, we found that this um, was a constant presence, particularly in sort of UK media, and sadly has not got any better um, since Anna did this particular piece of work. Um, and although uh, her work found that um, even the more right-leaning um, newspapers in the UK tended to be more sympathetic to individual migrants, in particular women, when they talked about migrants as a more face, a sort of faceless group where it was unclear who they were referred to, were they talking about asylum seekers, were they talking about refugees, were they describing economic migrants, then that became really a negative and that there was also this evidence of, of a migrant hierarchy and an impact on the ways in which people were viewed as being de de deserving of using uh, public sector services in general and health systems in particular. So I think it's clear that we can start to think about these wider operating conditions in the candidacy model as encompassing the asylum system itself. Um, the way in which racism and discrimination um, are played out and, in fact, um, can often be um, supported, um, sometimes subtly, sometimes overtly, and the impact that poverty and precarity has on people's rights and entitlements. And so I think, although the, the Dahlgren and Whitehead model is useful, I'm actually drawn to earlier work by George Kaplan, where he also has viewed um, the different ways in which different um, parts of the social determinants of health actually start to um, come together. So thinking from an individual through uh, their individual risk factors or socioeconomic status, and then expanding that out to think about um, their rights and regulations in terms of how they can live and work, the neighbourhoods that they might be able to choose to live in, the social and environmental factors, and then the wider sort of economic and political system. And I think it's clear that we really need to start thinking much more and voicing much more how um, both uh, the migration journey that people make and also this idea of a, a hierarchy, perhaps in inverted commas, how that impacts on people um, who are migrants. Um, and the, the different ways in which they can perhaps actually sort of punch through these different boxes that we see in, in, in the Kaplan model. So uh, for some people who come here um, to, to the high income countries, they may come in a more privileged position as a, as a migrant. Uh, they may come for different reasons, for example, for education and only be here a short time. And so their experience is going to be very different when compared to those who are here seeking asylum or who in fact find themselves um, here without documents or perhaps without leave to remain, having tried to achieve asylum. 
So I think this is really that we need to start thinking more and be more explicit about the way in which that process of that migration journey is in itself a social determinant of health. And so this is something we're sort of starting to, to think about and draw together from the work of, of Anna and Isaacs and Anna Black and also Alessio's work. Um, and it's something that we'll be interested to, to discuss with many of you as we're going forward. So thank you. I'll just stop sharing and shuffle over so Alessio can join. Thank you so much, uh, Kate and Alessio, for a really engaging presentation and so many. I've got so many questions, but I'm not going to have a chair's prerogative and I'm going to open it 